And again, you might like to reach your arms up overhead. Stretch up through the left side, the right side. Oh, let out any sounds. Ugh. And welcome. I was talking with a friend of mine a little while ago, and uh, I asked, I asked her this question. I said, was there ever a time in your life when you really went for something, you gave it your all, and then later you realized it wasn't what you really wanted? <laughs> there was a pause, and then she said, you mean you're talking about the first 50 years of my life? I know that feeling. <laughs> Maybe you do too. <laughs> you really go for it, and then you realize, ah, this isn't it. I'd like to talk and share with you some of the elements here around the the eighth of the ten perfections, which is referred to sometimes as strong determination. And just to kind of put this in context, again, this whole idea of the ten perfections are they're not so much around get this perfect, but it is a way of kind of reflecting on these inner qualities that when you really when you really pay attention to them, they they can really unveil uh, kind of a, our natural inner inner presence and inner beauty. The first is exploring generosity. It's interesting how the first one is about exploring what it means to be generous to yourself and to others. Generosity is this immediate way of, of softening the barrier between yourself and others. The second has to do with morality or virtue. It's kind of getting clear what is it that you want in your life and what are the rules by which you're going to live? What are the riverbanks that are going to support you? The next one has to do with renunciation, which is when you know what you want and you're kind of setting up the rules by which you're going to live, it's very helpful to do a very deep inventory in terms of, well, what are you not going to do? What are the, what are the activities that, that don't support you that you might, you might let go? in order to cultivate more of this natural inner presence and natural state. The next one has to do with cultivating wisdom, with, uh, of just cultivating your capacity to, to really see clearly, which leads right next in, into the next one, which is around cultivating vitality and vigor uh, in order to, to be on any journey, any path, you've got to have gas in the tank. Uh, your batteries have to be topped off. So it's an inventory as to what what feeds you, what what drains you, what what gives you energy, what are the wholesome ways you can cultivate more aliveness and vigor. And the next one points toward kind of an interesting balance to that sense of like energy that moves you forward. It's it's about patience, it's about tolerance, it's around making room for what arrives. And as you make room for what arrives, this brings up the next one, which is around cultivating truthfulness, looking for what is absolutely true, but also about being being truthful in your actions, in your speech. And now this leads to this exploration here around strong determination, around staying on the path, a, a certain sense of grit. I love these these teachings around the ten perfection because they I really feel they're they're really key. You know, the Dalai Lama said there's no getting around these essential ingredients. And in particular, determination, effort, and time are all part of what it means to be happy. So so determination and the grit of practice is what brings all these other qualities alive. It's, it's the kind of the unwavering decision. It, it overcomes hesitation. It allows you to be persistent. It has to do with willpower. And of course, there's a balance to willpower as well. Now, there's a line here. <laughs> This is where the teachings can get really extreme and, and where I think sometimes, you know, a lot of these teachings were kind of limited to lays, you know, male monks who were really going for it. Um, and there's this line that says, before his final awakening, referring to the Buddha, 
Let the blood and flesh of the body dry up and let the skin and sinews fall from the bones. I will not leave this seat before having attained supreme enlightenment. That's pretty intense. Uh, there are times when I can't go more than 10 minutes without checking my iPhone, let alone resolve to allow the blood and flesh of my body dry up, the skin and sinews fall from the bones before I get supremely enlightened. So I think there's a balance in here. You know, sometimes relying only on determination and willpower isn't so skillful. You know, it's those times when you realize you're climbing a ladder, but the ladder is not on the right wall. So I'd like to talk about the importance of knowing what you want and the importance of, of consciously setting your course when you know what you want. And then around developing grit, like these, these qualities of, of strong determination and how it can serve you. And then about remembering what you really want and remembering that this is a path of balance that will and determination can have a shadow side as well. So this whole sense of, of knowing what you want and then aligning yourself around it is so, so important. I'd like to read a little something about Helen Keller. People all over the world know the story of Helen Keller, the, the deaf and blind girl Annie Sullivan taught to communicate by spelling letters on her hands. And this, the whole story was turned into a play in a movie called The Miracle Worker. But what most people don't know is how Helen's parents found Annie Sullivan. Um, Helen Keller's mother, Kate, who also happened to be a cousin of Robert E. Lee, the Confederate general, was inspired by the story of the successful education of another uh, a deaf and blind girl, Laura Bridgman, which she read about in Charles Dickens' American Notes. And so, in 1986, she and Helen's father, Arthur, traveled from their home in Alabama to Baltimore to find a Dr. J. Julian Chisholm, uh, who was a noted expert for advice, and he referred them to Alexander Graham Bell, the guy who invented the telephone, who was working with deaf children at that time. And he, in turn, advised them to contact the Perkins Institute for the Blind, where Laura Bridgman had been educated. And so they traveled to Boston and they found Michael uh, Anaganos, who was the school's director, and asked a former student, Annie Sullivan, who was also visually impaired and also only 20 years old, to become her teacher. So when you think about all the obstacles that her parents had to overcome and follow this convoluted path to find Annie Sullivan in, in the late 1800s. I think it's easy to conclude that, that they must have had the same abundance of the same stuff that enabled Helen Keller to not only learn how to communicate, but also to be the first blind person to receive a Bachelor of Arts degree at Radcliffe, to read Braille, not only in English, but also in French, German, Greek, and Latin, and also to write and to publish. That's grit and determination. And when you think about, we all have had times in our lives when we really, really wanted something and we decided that we were gonna do whatever it took. I'm sure you've had those experiences. Many, many years ago, I decided that I wanted to be a teacher, that this is what I wanted to do, it was my calling. And at that time, I had another very, very full-time job and I could only sort of develop my teaching in my spare time. And I just decided to myself, and I remember this was a very, this kind of came out of my meditation practice where this line came forward, where I just said, I'll teach anything to anyone, anywhere, and anytime. But when I'm invited to teach, the answer is yes. And that, that sort of yes to, I'm gonna do this, <laughs> opened up all kinds of wild invitations too. I remember, um, saying yes to a talk at the local Rotary Club. And uh, I remember sitting there as lunch speaker. I remember sitting there staring at a breaded veal cutlet who was staring back at me, trying to be uh, be pleasant around uh, around my breaded veal cutlet. I, I said yes to orienting new guests uh, to our community, yes to assisting someone in their workshop, 
yes to opportunities to be a substitute teacher. Something in me really, really wanted this, and, and I made it a priority. And the thing is, when you really want something, you go through this process of, of feeling the desire, feeling the possibility, and then mobilizing your, your attention in that direction. And of course, something gets in the way. And that something is usually doubt or fear or lack of energy or maybe lack of courage. So you have to kind of contend with that calling and then call on some inner reserve to kind of make it happen. And quite often in an unexamined life, we defer to our primary caretakers and our culture to tell us what we want and what's possible. Or we, we want security. So we'll take something that's less than ideal, but it gives you a sense of belonging and it gives you a sense of you're going to get by. But at some point, there's something, there's some inner wake up call. What do you really, really want? And what's most important to you? And what are you willing to give up to make it happen? And then the journey begins. And so I keep coming back to this again and again, probably almost every talk. What's your highest intention? What do you want? Knowing that this life is temporary and filled with impermanence. What do you want? And to know what you want is important because an unexamined intention means you're either going to be living a life of self-preservation, living a life set by those who told you what was most important. And we also find ourselves filled with dissatisfaction. So that deep listening is so, so, so important. I try to only tell this story maybe once a year. It's one of my favorite stories. And it has to do around intention in the face of challenges. Back in my ashram days, early, early, early in the morning, I forget when we when I, we did our morning sadhana, but it was probably around five or something like that. Uh, we were always looking for ways to inspire ourselves. We did a lot of yoga and then, you know, chanting and meditation. And the room was always very, very dark. And there was a leader and, and the good friend of mine decided he was going to do something to kind of inspire us. And that was, he was at random going to ring a bell, <laughs> ring a bell and then read something from some yogic scripture. <clears throat> and so it was kind of interesting, you know, there'd be this little ding and then he'd read something. So this is probably about two thirds of the way through our, our morning session. And we were all in the, I think in the shoulder stand where you're, you know, you're, you're in your shoulders and you're kind of straight up, your legs are up overhead probably about 75, 80 people in the room. And then there's a little ding. And then, then these words, it went something like this. And I say unto you that of, of to take human form is rare, uh, to take human form and, and hear perennial truth or Dharma is even more rare. To take human form, to hear truth, and to contemplate truth is even rarer still. To take human form, to hear the truth, to contemplate truth, and engage in the practices that awaken truth is the rarest of the rare. And of all those who take human form, or hear truth, contemplate truth, engage in the practices to reveal truth, only one in every 500 years will be fully awakened. It was this long silence. And in the back of the room, there was this little upside down in the shoulder stand voice that said, gee, thanks, that's encouraging. And that was followed by a sound I'd never heard before, which is about 85 people falling out of the shoulder stand in hysterics. The idea of pursuing awakening, what, is, what does awakening mean? What does enlightenment mean? Of course, that's a whole other subject but but this idea of being deeply deeply free deeply deeply happy regardless of the externals 
what a what a huge compelling to know who and what you truly are to see clearly into the nature of reality that's a beautiful calling but but what if only one in 500 makes it <laughs> every 500 years but when you think about the times when you really hung in there maybe it was a new job a challenging relationship a call to a new project you had to overcome doubt you had to overcome the comparing mind you had to overcome the the calling just to give up you called on determination to make that happen and part of the alchemy of determination is to care deeply about what you want the why is so important the second is to just ignore the odds that are against you okay every 500 years someone makes it that's not great odds but i'm not going to think about that i'm going to bring my awareness to here and now and what calls me forward the third element is to prepare to endure this is why i love that mantra keep going no matter what keep going so caring about the goal is so critical and this is the why it it, it opens up passion emotion someone was talking to me about whether or not they were going to do the, the two-year meditation teacher training program that started recently they said I'm, I'm really conflicted you know like something in me really really wants to do it something in me is not so sure and i said well well why why do you want to do it it was a long pause and she said well i want to be helpful to people who are struggling especially people who feel stuck in the business world and, and, and wanting to find meaning. People like me, I really want to help that way. She kind of had her answer because the passion came forward. So when there's anything that you want or you think you want, ask yourself why. And when you really listen to the why, you may find it gives you the fuel to kind of keep on going so the why <clears throat> ignore the odds against you and prepare for the marathon which leads me to a story um, i'd like just to kind of read this little piece here uh, it was about the 1996 boston marathon i was a year out of college and working for an ad agency that paid me at the poverty line to wear really short skirts and flirt with the client. I wasn't up to speed on harassment laws at the time. I was just a corn-fed white girl looking for a keg party. <laughs> I split an apartment with three other girls, bartended at night to rise just above the poverty line, and had fun, fun, fun. I ran to stay in shape, but generally still thought of marathoners as one sandwich short of a picnic, or a hammer short of a full, full tool kit. Or assume the wheel was spinning, but the hamster was dead. Still, I admired them from afar. The day of the 1996 Boston Marathon, I had steered clear of the city. Then, after the event was well over, I met up with a friend for drinks at the bar near the finish line. It was a memorable, stressful evening as I had to decide, Corona with lime or without? Mozzarella sticks or nachos? This was way before I knew anything about refined carbohydrates or the glycemic index or saturated fats. In other words, life was perfect. As dark set in and my friend and I were in an hour, we were an hour deep into drinking and eating, Corona with lime, of course. I happened to glance out the window and notice a woman running down Boylston Street. What caught my attention was that she had some major physical challenges. Not to mention she was probably in her mid to late 60s. It's difficult to explain how she was running, but it was as if she hopped forward on one foot, paused, and then dragged her other foot in line. The foot being dragged looked as if it had no ability to hold weight or that it was possibly paralyzed. Regardless, I remember being impressed. She was going out for a run at such a busy time in the evening and thinking that it must take her an hour to run a mile, but wasn't it uncomfortable? 
But as she got closer, an, an aching sensation spread through my insides. She had a number on, a Boston Marathon bib pinned to her shirt. Now, my little grasshoppers, when I say the marathon was over, I mean over. <clears throat> Cheering crowds had evaporated. Police presence was gone. The finish line dismantled. Aid stations long since packed up. The marathon course had been open to traffic for quite a while. What was thought to be the last runner had crossed the finish line hours beforehand. Hours. But here she was. This warrior of a woman with a significant disability had started her day in Hopkinton and was finally two blocks from the finish. I'm sure the last 13 miles, if not more, had been devoid of aid stations. I'm sure as she ran through the center of Wellesley, no one even knew she was in the race. Just a woman out for a slow, slow jog. And here's what went down next. Me. Maggie, that woman is running. Maggie, so? Me, no, I mean running as in the marathon. Well, that can't be. It's over. But she has a number on. Oh, my God, she's still running the marathon? After about 30 seconds of stunned silence, we threw money on the table and sprinted out the door and on to Boylston. Maggie went to one side of her and I to the other. We started clapping cheering, shouting, and crying, as in Niagara Falls down the sides of our faces crying. The woman nodded in, in acknowledgement and carried on. Over the course of those remaining blocks, other people on the street began to understand what was going on and joined our, our cheering squad. <clears throat> and honest to God, we became a random group of 18 to 20 sobbing strangers jogging next to her, witnessing one of the most spectacular displays of grit, determination, and hard work. Hard, hard work. We never got her name. She wasn't talking about at the end that she just wanted to go home. Can you blame her? And she gently but firmly pushed away our offer to help her home. As if someone tough enough to run a seven-plus-hour marathon with a major physical impediment would need our help. Her name would never show up in the list of finishers because there's a cutoff time. And in that cutoff time, after, after that cutoff time, an athlete doesn't count in the record books. But it seemed obvious she wasn't out there for glory and the recognition. She was out there to finish what she started. Her other motivations we'll never know. It's easy for us to glorify elite athletes and marvel at their talent. But I've been around endurance racing to know that the people who work the hardest who experience the most suffering and have to dig the deepest and overcome the biggest obstacles are not those who come in first. In many cases, those who come in last. And while I don't know who our mystery runner was, I want everyone to know that she existed <clears throat> and what she accomplished that day. Sad and awful things happen in the world, even at a marathon. But there are also people like this runner who remind me that it's easier to persevere when surrounded by adoration and attention. But those who can still find their wings alone in the dark and silence truly embody the spirit behind Boston Strong. That's grit and determination. When we can call on those reserves in our life, Amazing things can happen. This line, and as a mountain, a rock, stable and firmly placed, does not tremble in rough winds, but remains precisely in its own place. So you too must be constantly stable in resolute determination. Going on the perfection of resolute determination, you will attain self-awakening. In other words, keep going. A study done at West Point exploring those who were the most successful in life determined that it wasn't intelligence, it wasn't natural aptitude. What made all the difference was, in a word, grit. 
So it's been said that there are five characteristics of grit that are so important. The first one is courage. Know what you know what you want and be willing to fail. As Mahatma Gandhi said, better to fail in your own path than to succeed living another person's path. So first is courage. The second is to be conscientious. That is to say, be dependable. Stay with it. The third is endurance and follow through. It's about patience with purpose. The fourth is resilience of cultivating optimism. People with grit tend to think everything's going to be okay in the end. And if it's not all right now, it's not the end. Really having that belief system. And the fifth is thinking rather than perfection to think of excellence. Perfection is about meeting someone else's standards. Excellence is meeting your own. Courage, conscientiousness, follow through, resilience, and excellence. These are the qualities that when you refine them, become the fuel that help you move forward. And I might add, compassion doesn't hurt. The Zen master Shunryo Suzuki talked about three different kinds of racehorses. There is the racehorse that will move when you think that it should move faster. And there's the racehorse that will move once you tap it on the behind. And then there's the racehorse that will move only when it is repeatedly reminded with the, with the riding crop. And of course, he says, we all want to be the first horse. But he also says that that third horse, the one that needs to be reminded and prodded, calls for a great sense of compassion. And when we can allow ourselves that sense of compassion toward ourselves to be that third racehorse, that becomes really key as well. Determination with compassion. Sometimes the striving mind can be a challenge for us. So we kind of explore balance and balance is, is so critical. My, my wonderful wife, who's uh, kind of a type A yogi, <laughs> was incredibly intense in her practice. Uh, we, we lived in separate ashrams in different traditions, but in her ashram, they, they were uh, at a very, very rigorous form of yoga, and she was kind of gifted in terms of that, that kind of yoga. So she would be up before everyone else, starting her, her practices early in the morning, and she would meet with different teachers, and she would often ask, well, this is what I'm doing, and what would you suggest? And they'd say, maybe you need to just soften and relax a little more. And then she would write that down. Okay, yeah, I got to relax. That's what I got to do. I'll work relaxation in my routine. Finding that point of balance becomes really critical. For some of us, I'd say for a lot of us, cultivating a little more grit, particularly when it comes to meditation, can be tremendously helpful. To find a time to sit every day, to determine a length that you can manage, and then to stay with it. That requires a certain amount of determination, a certain amount of steadiness, a certain amount of focus and commitment. Some of us, we may find that our practice is more around softening and letting go. And what you may find in your life is that it's really a balance, that there are times when really exploring, opening and receiving is exactly what you need. And then there are times when 
it's really helpful to dial it in and go for it. There's a story about the um, about the um, the one who is most clo the closest to to the Buddha, Ananda, sort of his uh, um, his number two. You know, he would sort of help him. You know, through his life in terms of organizing things and taking care of him. After the passing of the Buddha, there was a a gathering of those, and again, I, I may not be telling this well, um, but from my understanding in the story is that that after the Buddha's passing, there was to be a gathering of of those who were awakened, you know, those 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 people who had been studying with him, who had achieved some degree of awakening, and Ananda was not included because he was not considered like fully awakened. Um, Again, this is way my interpretation, but he wanted to be in that circle. And so he kind of doubled down his practices. You know, he took that resolve, you know, I don't know if it was quite, I'm not going to move until I'm awakened, but I am going to bring myself deeply, deeply, fully to to the practices of absorption and gathering and all, all of that. So he deeply, deeply gave himself to the practices of doing, you know, the willful practices of present moment awareness. At some point, after a long time of those practices, something shifted and he decided that he was just going to let go. And so he dropped all technique, he dropped all control he dropped all desire and then the awakening arose that for him it was when he only opened into receiving into deep deep surrender and letting go that the awakening arose where does that where does that leave us in our practice as I like to say over and over again, possibly ad nauseum, I like to think of this practice as a practice of self-awareness and self-diagnosis. That there's, there's a wisdom faculty inside you that knows when you could sit up a little straighter, that you are wasting energy, that you're distracting yourself, that, that gathering your attention in the here and now, applying yourself is what you need. And as well, there is something inside that re that recognizes that wisdom faculty that realizes I'm too grim. I'm holding on too tight. I'm too narrow. I'm too rigid. I need to explore the practices around self kindness and compassion and self care and receiving and letting go. How do you know? where to go? How do you know how to respond to your experience? In one way you can look at it is it's relatively simple. And that is this built in feedback loop that's perfectly designed for you to let you know when you're out of balance called suffering. <laughs> I was talking with a good friend of mine many, many years ago around diet. I've always had a, a lot of interest around diet and its effect on consciousness and so forth. And he said, he said, you know, my, my approach to diet is I, I just eat what I, what I like until I get sick of it. And I think there's a huge amount of wisdom in that. We kind of do what we're doing until we're sick of it. And hopefully as, as you become more aware, as you call on mindfulness and more and more non-judging awareness, you begin to recognize more quickly oh, kind of what you get sick of, the, the inner signals that are telling you, hey, you know what? You've just explored this extreme. How about coming back to center? So finding that balance is so, so, so important. So what I would like to do is to lead you into a short, experience of what's called the Aditan meditation. We've just got a, got a little bit of time left to kind of get a sense of 
of this like essential practice of meditation because it can be a, a, a really, really helpful technique. The first time I, I explored the Aditan meditation was at a 10 day retreat with SN Goenka and, and it was one sit a day. So it was either 45 minutes or an hour. I believe it was probably 45 minutes. I'm not sure, I don't remember. But the intention was for that 45 minutes or an hour to sit with strong determination. And then just to say, you, you choose an anchor. In this case, the anchor was either breath or doing an inner body scan. But outwardly, the intention was not to move an extraneous muscle. That is to say, the only muscles that you're kind of allowed to allow move are the muscles of breath. Everything else, any little shifting, adjusting, scratching your nose, that's verboten. But now what I have found, just as a preview, is that some of my biggest breakthroughs were doing this meditation. That I found myself like moving through that, that uh, restless, resistant mind and sort of like breaking through into a sense of stream of here and now. I, I've had some experiences of like a very powerfully, like deeply recognizing the witness, you know, recognizing that I'm not this body, I'm not these emotions, I'm not these sensations, but, but I, am, I am the awareness of what changes. Hugely powerful. Most of the time, this practice is brutal and excruciating. <laughs> so <laughs> while it has a tremendous, tremendous goal, there is there is some work around it. So we're going to we're going to uh, end this talk with a, a little practice of Aditan meditation. So if you like, you can reach your arms up overhead, stretch up to the left side, the right side. This is only going to be for a few minutes, but just to give you a taste. If you like, you can close your eyes and with your eyes closed, let your body sway a little bit to the left and right. Feel the movement from the inside. Make any little adjustments to your posture. Anywhere you feel a little tension or tightness, let yourself move. And then in your own time now, let yourself begin to settle in. Let your body become very still inside. And let your attention move to, to an anchor of your choosing. Again, it may be to, to the breath at the nostrils of the belly, maybe to be awake to the sounds or the felt sense of the palms of the hands. And your, your task here is the sense of you can maintain moment to moment awareness at the point of your anchor and simultaneously to refrain from moving any extraneous muscles. When the mind wanders, gently bring your attention right back. And as we take one more minute, what could soften inside? How intimately can you feel and experience your anchor from the inside with the body perfectly still?
And now with the eyes closed, release the technique and just feel the imprint. Notice the quality of presence. If you like, you can gently open the eyes. Developing your capacity for grit and determination can have a huge upside. I recently started again taking, ending my showers with a, with a really, really cold shower. Um, all the studies, you know, say just how amazing it is for your body and for the mind and um, all this great stuff, you know, the uh, deep cold water immersion. And what I've noticed is that I rarely want to do it. And I try to do it for between one and three minutes, which is which is long enough to to realize you're, you're it's not like you can pretend it isn't happening. <laughs> but what I've noticed is that when I can move through that experience of the resistance to the cold and allow my body to get that really deep shock of cold water, I feel fantastic afterward. I feel alert and awake and alive. In that same way, when, when you have things in your life you know are good for you, but you don't want to do them, calling on strong determination is that is that element that can help you to kind of move through of kind of renouncing sort of the short-term happiness of of evasion to the long-term result of what it feels like when you give yourself fully and call on that sense of grit and determination you know so many of the of the non-dual teachers that, that are you know on the planet now quite often speak about how how life is really just about flow and letting things be and that's really what it's all about but i've noticed that pretty much all of them from what i can tell from my flawed perspective is that almost all of them have done long deep practices of strong determination of using concentration practice to arrive and coming back again to that sense of witness. So may, may this understanding of strong determination be a tool for you in your life to realize that life is all about balance. It's all about paradox. But at the same time, that there may be times in your life when calling on reserves, you know, calling on that inner strength, remembering what's most important, what you really, really want, and calling on strong determination to help you move there can be not only really skillful, but the fruits can be absolutely amazing. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Uh, I so wish you well in your practice, and I look forward to seeing you again. Thank you.